Well, we're going to be in the Bible again today, of course, and uh, that's what we do if you've not been here before. We've been working our way through the book of John. We're going to be in John 4, at the very end of John 4, on into the beginning of John 5. Today I'm going to tie two stories together that my guess is most often you've heard preached separately, but as I look through, as I study, as I learn, as I grow myself, there, there's a connecting point here, and hopefully I'll be able to make that connecting point for you as well. And so, whereas in the past you probably have heard these separated, today we're going to bring them together. But what that does mean is I'm going to read a little, uh, little longer segment of Scripture in order to encompass both of these uh, miracles. So, uh, in the book of John, John talks about signs, signs and wonders. Signs are, are things that Jesus has done that, that speak and attest to uh, He being the Christ and He being God in flesh. And so uh, we've seen a number of these signs. The very first one, of course, was uh, turning water into wine and, and on and on. We've had a number of different signs throughout uh, the book of John thus far. And today we're going to have two more of these signs. And they're going to be two healings as, a, as we dig into this. And so if you've got a Bible, John 4, 46 is where we're going to jump off from. There are some Bibles in the chairs. There are also Bibles on the Welcome Center. If you don't own a Bible, take one of those Welcome Center Bibles with you. It's a gift from us to you. Uh, when they're gone, I will buy more, I promise. We will not run out of Bibles. And uh, we love to give Bibles away. In fact, uh, I got to give away again this week two Bibles to two more kids. And that's one of the most exciting things in my job is to be able uh, to open up a crack open. You know, I, I'm a book nerd. Just go into my office, you'll see that. And, and I love cracking open new Bibles and, and the smell of new book. You know, I mean, there's a couple of, of, of smells in life that, that you love. New books, new shoes, and new cars, right? And... Uh, there's just something about them. And so you crack open that new Bible, and I personalize everyone. I put the kid's name in there and write a little note to them and, and uh, just a little blessing to them and, you know, sign it in Glory Baptist Church, Aiken, Minnesota. And then we get to give these, uh, in this case, two young girls uh, the Word of God that they could go home and sit down with moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters and read that. And what influence and impact that might have, we don't know, but we know it's the Word of God and it doesn't return empty. And so uh, one of the great things we do is we give Bibles away. So if you don't have one, take one off of our Welcome Center. We'd love to bless you with that. And uh, if you don't, uh, iPhones, iPads, whatever you got, Android, the U version is a good Bible app. But again, John 4, 46, and we're going to kind of get another front row seat into the amazing things that Jesus does today. Um, the front row seat that we've kind of had all along here in the book of John, um, uh, of these happenings in the gospel of John, and, and all these things kind of revolve around the authority of, of Jesus. And we're going to see today that the authority of Jesus, that he has this authority over human categories. And we're also going to see that the authority of Jesus is over human frailty. And we're going to look at how his authority uh, lands on us and how it can be, at times, a, a struggle for us, in fact. And with that said, as I said, we're going to be in John 4, 46. And here's what it says. You can read along or you'll see it up on the screen. And it says, So he, Jesus, came again to Cana in Galilee, uh, where he had made the water into wine. <clears throat> and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man had heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and he asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And so pausing there, he just kind of, Jesus kind of rebukes this guy in a sort of way. But then look what happens. And then it says, the official said to him, sir, <clears throat> come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. And there it says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when his son began to get better. And they said to him, it was yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. And the father, you see, he knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And so he believed in all of his household as well. This was now the second sign Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Then it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. colonnades sorry. 
In this lay a multitude of invalids, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One man who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man, sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said it to you? Take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Now afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now there are two things in particular happening here around the authority of Jesus as, that I mentioned just a moment ago. And you'll see them in your notes if you're following along. And the first one you're seeing is the authority of Jesus over human categories. And let me explain that. If we follow the flow, the narrative arc of the Gospel of John, Jesus is engaging people all across the social spectrum. If you remember back to the, the first interaction we see with Jesus, it's Jesus and Nicodemus, right? And Nicodemus is this, this ruling guy. He's kind of a religious elite guy, kind of a religious bigwig, so to speak. And Jesus calls him into this life and calls him to surrender his authority as only the Son of God, as only the Christ could call someone into. And then from, from Nicodemus, who is this high religious official, we see this invitation that Jesus gives to this, this low, this outcast, this Samaritan woman, right? And he gives this invitation to her to come into to new life. He, he offers her e eternal life, this, this water that springs forth that, that will never be quenched, right? And then now in this story, we have yet again another kind of high secular official who comes. And Jesus again invites him into this life. And then there's this, this invalid, this socially low, this man of 38 years of not being able to walk, who he too is called into this life. Jesus is deconstructing the, the human categories that, that, that all of us, whether we're aware or not, all of us, we make decisions based around these categories. And we make decisions about, effectively, who ultimately matters and who doesn't in some cases. Look at me. I, I know nobody in the room thinks that you do that, right? I don't think I do that. I mean, I teach on the Imago Dei. We are made in the image of God, right? And, 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 and we want to say that we think everybody matters equally. The truth of the matter is, if you watched my life, if I watched your life, if we watched one another, you would see that none of us treats everybody equally. There's always a little bit of different treatment. It's, it's just about impossible to overcome in how we actually treat other people. And what strikes me as, as fascinating is that when Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the festival, he doesn't start at the temple, right? He doesn't go to all the places in Jerusalem, all the destination places that you think you'd want to go to if you were going to Jerusalem, right? And there's, there's just, you know, if, if you're a Jew going to Jerusalem, this is where you go. But 
That's not what Jesus does. He doesn't start at these places in Jerusalem that you just have to see, so to speak, right? Uh, they were on the trip advisor back in those days or whatever it was that they used to figure that out. I don't know. But uh, instead, he goes to these colonnades where all of these invalids are, right? The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, the weak. All these, all these social outcasts, the low people, they're hanging out there. I don't know if you've traveled the world much or not, but when you go to other places, particularly in other countries, oh, I tell you, I, I've experienced this. Sometimes when you go to other places, and, and you'll experience this particularly in missions, not, I'm not talking going to resorts. You know, you can go to an isolated resort in a third world country and have a first world experience. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking when you really get into the nitty gritty, when you go to one of these cities, when you visit somewhere in India and you, and you get off the main roads or, you know, I've been in places in Mexico and there's a smell there. And it's not a pleasant smell. But there's a smell in some of these places, right? Uh, and sometimes the smell of where the, this whole community is can make your eyes burn almost. Just the, the stench of whatever it is. And it's a smell that you'll never forget. You'll always associate with that experience. Smells are powerful things. They set us mentally to things, both good and bad. And that's the kind of place that Jesus went to, the place that didn't smell quite right, right? That's where Jesus went. When Jesus showed up at Jerusalem, he doesn't go to the temple. He goes to Skid Row. He starts there. And he's deconstructing human categories of who it is that ultimately matters. And one of the things that we see here about the authority of Jesus over human categories is that he tends to transcend all sorts of different things. He transcends socioeconomics. He transcends people's gifts and abilities. He transcends ethnicity. He transcends whatever people's backgrounds are and what people's current reality is. Jesus is bigger than all of that. And if you've read your Bible, you may have noticed this, that the, the people that God uses most profoundly are not the kind of people you would want to hire to work with you, right? You ever notice that? You, you can pretty much pick whoever you want out of the Bible. I mean, there's like four people in the Bible that don't fit this category. There's like four people that would count, four people that would pass muster that you would probably hire. And one of those is Christ. The other three, I mean, there's three other decent people. And the rest of them are screwballs, right? I mean, it, it's broken human rejects with significant issues, whether it's anger Moses killed a guy because he was angry, right? Whether it's lust, King David killed a guy because of lust. Whether it's greed, whatever it is, they're humans. <coughs> and they're on the fringe. And what Jesus does is he brings them into the kingdom and he gives them life and he uses them profoundly. And I often wonder how many people are in this day and age still kind of sitting on the sidelines of life, of ministry. They're spectators in this great call that God has given us because they feel like, well, I'm just not good enough to serve, to do that, to be part of that, right? How many people miss out? How many people hold themselves out? How many people sit on the sidelines and don't ever get involved because they don't feel like they're good enough. Well, I want to love you enough to say that you won't ever be good enough, right? Because it's not our goodness. It's His goodness that we lean into. It's not our own. It's not our power. It's God's power, right? And Jesus' authority transcends our categories. He shatters them. And He goes and He, and he, and he, and he picks an invalid of 38 years. An invalid. You know what those two words mean? Invalid. Invalid. Doesn't matter. This person, they can't contribute, right? 
Yet Jesus, this is what Jesus chooses to go. And it's not just his authority over human categories. We also see that Jesus has authority over human frailty as well. Our fragility, our, our bodies that are temporary vessels at best. First of all, let's just say about the two healings in this passage. They're spectacular, right? The two healings that Jesus performs in the story that I read to you just moments ago here in John 4 and 5, they're, they're in and of themselves just amazing stories. I mean, this dad comes from Capernaum to Cana. And if you don't know, that's 20 miles by foot. And he comes to ask Jesus to heal his son. And it's obvious, at that point in the story, that his son is not going to make it. No father walks 20 miles when his son's going to recover, right? And so it's in a, a, a great deal of desperation, this, this man who has money, this man who has influence, this man who has power, this man who has a title, he, he, he feels a, a universal human experience, which is powerlessness. And in desperation, he walks 20 miles, 40 miles round trip, right? This isn't a light undertaking. In the hope that Jesus, this man that he has heard about, in the hope that he might heal his son. So, so he approaches Jesus. And what does Jesus do, as I mentioned? Jesus kind of rebukes him, doesn't he? Will you heal my son? Jesus is like, oh, you guys always need a sign. You won't believe. You always want the magic, right? And in desperation, even after being rebuked, the father is undeterred. He says, sir, heal my son. And so Jesus, from 20 miles away, heals this boy. Go, and your son is well. There's this fascinating story here of, of powerful and miraculous healing. Jesus with power over life and death, over our fragility, right? And in a, in a blink of an eye, the course of a young man's life is changed. The whole family's faith is changed forever. That's power, folks. That's authority. And in the other sign, we're going to see another powerful, instantaneous healing, right? And I don't want you to miss the fact that this man has been an invalid for 38 years. This isn't like something that just happened. 38 years. That's a long time to be waiting on the Lord. Right? Right? I mean, I've had to wait a couple of months for something and gotten awfully impatient over that. 38 years. 38 years of praying. 38 years of wanting to be healed. 38 years of being stuck before breakthrough finally happens. And we need to live our lives as Christians in expectation of breakthrough. But we also have to have the patience to wait on the Lord. God is good. But it's in His time. And the thing that I want to highlight in this is His authority over the human fragility and the fact that powerlessness is a universal human experience. If you live long enough, you will eventually feel powerless at some point. This man, 38 years an invalid, is powerless to get down into the water. This secular official, with all of his wealth and power and influence, still cannot heal his son. And here's part of the invitation around Jesus' authority. You see, you and I, we are limited in our authority. Right? I mean, I have some authority. But that authority is evident at its limits when I try to teach my dog or command him to do something, right? 
how, how well your dog listens to will attest to your ability to have authority. I mean, I have some authority. There's a few people who answer to me. I'm, I'm a leader at the church. I'm the pastor, right? So I have a little bit of authority. But my authority is, is fragile and it's limited. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, when, when, when I begin to feel powerless, a, a couple of things happen. Uh, I, I begin to double down on control. I, I begin to get angry over it. Anybody else ever feel that way? When you start to feel powerless? And when I... When I, when I begin to feel a little powerless, you know, I like, I, my natural response is to grab another gear and shift up and go a little bit harder, right? I power up my, my intuitive gifts, the gifts that God wove into me, that He's given to me, that I'm supposed to be using for His glory and my gladness. But what happens is I'll begin to try to control a situation, and almost always that makes things worse. And I'll feel fear. And the reason we feel fear when we're powerless is we're out of control. And we don't like that. And when we feel that fear, for many of us, that fear is a response, causes us to become angry. We're mad that we can't control it. We're mad that we can't be in charge. We're mad that we can't change that thing. And instead of resting on the one with all power, instead of resting on the one who is able, instead of resting on the Son of God, Christ, the sovereign King of everything, I put the weight on me. And in anger and in my exhaustion, I try to keep fighting my way forward, right? To my own shame. And to the hurt of everybody who's around me. And one of the things that you're, you're seeing Jesus do right here is He goes, I'm the one who has all the power. I'm the one who has the power over human fragility. You don't. At your strongest, you're weak, right? At your best, you're not good enough. Cheery message today, Pastor. Thanks. But you're going to see Jesus start to guide us as we work our way here through the Gospel of John. And he's like, listen to me. When you are at your most desperate, when you're most powerless, when you're most needy, that's when he is at his greatest. That's when Jesus is the most powerful. That's where His glory can be on display. How upside down does that sound? Certainly sounds upside down to the outside world. When you have no more cards to play, that is when Jesus says, you will see my hand. And if we can be real for just a moment, right? The truth of the matter is, I would honestly much rather see his hand when I have lots of energy, when things are going awesome. I'd love to have Jesus show up every time when, when everything was sailing and going great, right? That's when I want Jesus to show up. And, and if, I, if I could rewrite this, which you certainly don't want me rewriting the Bible, but if I could, you know, I, I would change it to be like that. Like, like when things are going good, then Jesus shows up with an extra bonus blessing. There are so many texts in the Bible that are trying to teach us, trying to disciple us, however, that are the opposite of that. Jesus is continually trying to point out when we are weak, He is strong. Meekness and weakness and desperation and brokenness, that is a launching pad for Jesus' power. So when you're struggling and when you're down, when things are going rough, that is when Jesus is at his best. And part of that means I need to continually be aware of my own tendency to, to want to control situations where I feel powerless, right? Right? As, as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor, as a leader, I like to and I want to be in control. 
I mean, I, I, I'm a gifted man in a couple of areas, uh, a couple of things in the life that I'm not bad at, actually. And, and, and like most of us, our natural tendency is to take those things that we are good at and try to overcompensate, try to cover up those things that I'm not really good at. And so it's easy for me to rely on those couple of gifts that I might have, those abilities, those talents, when I feel powerless. And I try to overcompensate for my weakness. But the authority of, of Jesus beckons me to, to rest instead in His authority. Not to try to flex my own. And if I, if I do that, if I, if I try to do it on my own, then I'm, I'm not trusting. So He calls us to rely upon Him, to lean into Him. And as I said, one of the things we're seeing here is Jesus' authority over our physical frailty, our fragility, our ability to be broken. But it's not just physical fragility. In fact, I want to argue there's, there, there's a double healing that happens in both of these stories. Now let me show this to you. Look at back at verse 53 if you're following along. First, of course, you have the obvious physical healing of the son who's 20 miles away. And then it, what you read here in 53, it says, The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all of his household. So we have a double healing going on here. You have the physical healing that leads to the spiritual healing, right? There was not belief, and now there is belief. There was desperation before, and that gives way to faith now. All accomplished by the one who actually had the power. This man is not just saved physically. His whole household is healed spiritually. Uh, amazing, amazing power. Now look in John 5, 14 and 16, 15 and 16. Jesus then heals the invalid. The story tells us that this man of 38 years of being an invalid doesn't know who healed him. And then Jesus in turn seeks him out because the healing was yet incomplete. It says afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Then the man went away and he told the Jews it was Jesus who had healed him. Now Jesus, there's something going on here. Jesus is doing something here I just want to touch on real quickly and warn you against. And then we'll move on to more details. Jesus is making something that you and I should not be too quick to make, a connection there. See, Jesus here in this instance is making a connection between sin and sickness. You see that? <coughs> but that's not generally the case. If you're the kind of person who, who, who naturally is inclined to see somebody who's sick and think it must be a sin, go read John 9. We'll get there, right? But go ahead and jump ahead and read John 9, okay? Because it's pretty clear in John 9 that Jesus talks about sickness is not, for the most part, due to sin. It's not because mom and dad had sinned or anything like that. That's not the punishment for your misbehavior causing you to be sick. So if your natural inclination is towards thinking that, read John 9. But this individual in this individual case, there's something in this man's life that was sinful. And it was connected to him being an invalid for 38 years. So Jesus heals him. And then he warns him to not sin so that something worse might happen to him. Now we see other echoes of this in the Bible as well. Psalm 32, 3 through 5. David says, For when I kept silent, and he's talking about his sins, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. 
For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Selah simply means think about this or, or dwell on this idea, right? And then it says, I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. And if we just stopped at this point, this is a Jesus that almost everybody would want to get on board for, right? That Jesus is all-powerful where we are powerless. Walk with Jesus. Everybody's like, oh, he has power, right? I'm in on that. I like that. I like that Jesus. Jesus that can physically heal. Jesus that who can spiritually heal. Anybody with depression or anxiety or emptiness or whatever is like, yeah, I want some of that. Give me some of that. And what's happening in this passage around the authority of Jesus is that if we're not careful, we can believe that somehow we can harness Jesus' authority, kind of like a genie in the bottle for us. But you actually see the authority of Jesus landing on men and women in a way that leads them it says in the story to in fact persecute Jesus. It causes them to hate Jesus, to ultimately want to kill Jesus, as it's read in that passage. Look at verse 16. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. A couple of interesting things there. First, it was illegal to do work on the Sabbath, so they're angry about that. And then Jesus says, I am. And if you don't know your Old Testament, that kind of stems out of the Exodus. When he says, I am, he's basically claiming that he's God. That's blasphemy, right? And so that's why they're, they're seeking to kill him. It says that's why the, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And we need to understand that the authority of Jesus is going to confront our strongly held beliefs in our lives. And in this passage, that strongly held belief for them at the time was about the Sabbath. Jesus in his life and with his authority is confronting this strongly held belief and it's created anger and animosity towards the authority that Jesus holds. So much so that they couldn't even celebrate that this man who had been an invalid for 38 years was healed. The cripple was made walking again. And they couldn't celebrate it. Instead it made them angry. Because he was confronting their authority their strongly held beliefs, which happen to be about the Sabbath. Now in 2019 here, right, most of us don't have these strongly held convictions about the Sabbath. But Jesus is going to confront us anyhow. He's not just a teacher. He's God. He's going to confront our culture around issues like things of, of sexuality, around things about marriage, about things and issues of personal holiness. He's going to confront us, and when that confrontation happens, we will either say, the authority of Jesus wins, or my preference wins, right? And Jesus is meant to serve my desires, and what I want, and what I think is best. What is best for me, right? And we might not think that's going to happen to us, but it will. The Word of God, the Spirit of Christ dwelling inside of you, confronts all of us, different times and different ways and different places. But all of us are at some point challenged. Are we going to submit to the one with power? Am I going to submit to the King of Kings? Am I going to submit to the Lord of Lords? Or am I going to choose and say, no, I'm the King and I'm the Lord of my life. And I would testify to you that I would love it if Jesus and I just got into one little skirmish over this issue, right? But in like 25 years of following Jesus, in 25 years of trying to fully surrender my life to Him, 
This problem of who is in control and who has the power and who has the authority comes up again and again for me and I'm sure for all of you. The righteous path is often the difficult path. It's not always easy to follow the Lord, even with all the promises that we know are true. There are things that Jesus asks us to step into. And He asks us to step up into them because He knows what's best for us far better than we do. Now, I'm smarter than my 10-year-old son, right? Now, this doesn't have to do with intellect alone, of course. It has to do with the fact that I'm 45. I just turned 45 last week. And he's 10, which means I've seen the world in a way that he has not, right? So i got a leg up. i got an advantage. And if God is infinite, and he's always been and he always will be, when he and I disagree, and surely we're going to disagree at some point, but if he is God and I am not, if he is the one who is to be trusted and I'm not, then who should we rely upon? We are frail, we are broken. We are simply jars of clay. We do not have the infinite all power. So yeah, Jesus' authority is going to confront us just as it does the people in the story here. And this is why some people don't follow Jesus. They love the idea of His healing power. You'll hear people talk about God is love, right? Jesus is love. But hear this. Love is weighty. It's not just an emotive thing. It puts on parameters and guards and guardrails and guidelines and rules and things you need to follow in order to stay within. I love my son. Therefore, he has some rules. Not to crush him, but for his safety, for his well-being, for his joy even. Yes, we have grace, but it comes with more than just free reign. So where are you in the authority of Jesus in your life? He can't just be a magic healer and a spirit sprinkler. It can't be all about what you want. Your creation of your perfect God to be your Savior. That's not how Jesus works. That's not how Jesus is. That's not who God is. It's not even what we want. Because we don't have the power. He is Lord rightfully, demanding our submission. And it's a process to get there. It's a journey. But it ends with eternal life, so it's worth it. Hear me today. Surrender to His authority. It's not always easy. And you will constantly be buttonheads with God. But it is worth it. Because He's got the power. And when I am weak, He is strong. Amen? Let's pray. God, again, we are amazed by Your power. And God, even in this very moment, we repent against the times where we rebel against your authority. God, you, you can do so much more than we can. You see the big picture that we do not. You know all. You control all. God, we want to be in control. We want to be the one making the call, making the decisions. We want to be the final authority in our lives. But Lord, that just results in a mess. Whenever I think I'm in control, I'm out of control. So God, in this day, I just pray that each and every one of us hear in my voice. Even if we've done it before, we would do it again. That we would surrender our control to you. Because you are the one who has the power to do all things. You can heal. You can set us free. 
God, sometimes it's scary to not be in control, but Lord, we hope and trust in you, knowing that you know more than we do. You have far greater resources than we do, and that you are working for our good no matter what. So on this day, Lord, we, we repent of where we've been holding on to power and authority that was yours in actuality. God, may we learn to hope and trust in you more this week. And Lord, as we lean into that, as we hope and trust you, may others see that. May they see our humility, our willingness to submit to your authority, that you might be the guiding light of our lives. And then in that, Lord, may we make much of you, bringing you all glory and praise. Lord, we honor you. We love you. And we thank you in the holy and beautiful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we'll have a prayer team here at the front. You're welcome to come on down and have a little bit of time with prayer with them. Otherwise, as you go forth this week, go forth with the joy of the Lord, knowing that he loves you, he is for you, and he expects great things out of you. Go and serve your king.